longest it's hanging minute, on. The longest minute it's ever. Hanging on. No. All right. We'll call to order the Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. Um, first item agenda is roll call. Miller? Here. Rosado? <coughs> Beck? Here. Knott? <coughs> Chanzit? Here. Salvati? Wolf? Here. O'Brien? Here. Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? And McFadden? Here. Okay. Next up will be the reminder to please speak into the microphone for BATP. Um, next will be items to be removed, added, or changed. Um, we do want to add a 7A tonight for an executive session on real estate. Nothing will come out of that, just information. And then next will be matters from the public. Anybody from the public want to address this tonight? Okay. We'll move very quickly then into number five, presentation on the third quarter review of strategic plan. Yes, so um, when I saw that this was the only item on the agenda for this week, I strongly considered canceling it. However, given the fact that next Tuesday will be our first budget meeting, I thought it might be good to have all of this fresh in our mind about um, where we're currently at with regard to the strategic action plan, and then to be thinking about prioritization of uh, those items which we don't have identified funding for. So um, first I'll just kind of go over where things stand. Um, I think we made uh, progress on a number of items in the third quarter. The uh, first objective that I'd like to discuss is the investigation of the feasibility of a parking lot for train commuters. And um, in September, we had a visit from our friends at PACE, and they gave a presentation on their, uh, what used to be called Dial A Ride, and is now called PACE On Demand, and also a um, an app that they have created for that service. Um, as a reminder, that runs Monday through Friday from 6.30 a.m. to 6.50 p.m., and a ride costs only $2 per way, so long as the uh, person is paying with a Ventra card. Um, if they want to pay in cash, they can pay in cash, and that's $2.25. And rides can be booked either by phone or by using the app or by going online. And this is a... Uh, door-to-door -door service so you can uh, request to be picked up at a certain point and dropped off at a certain point it's not just for um, commuters going to the train station and also you can set up a recurring ride um, through the service so um, this appears to be a very cost-effective way to provide our Batavia commuters with um, a, a way to avoid having to take their own vehicle to the train station which in the last report, we, or maybe while Pace was here, we noted this is important because we know that there's going to be a big construction project uh, coming up in, in Geneva at the train station to add the third rail line. Um, and so my question at this point is, do we feel like this is uh, the solution that would address the needs that we were concerned about when we identified this as an objective? Or do we feel like um, this pace option is um, an alternative, but doesn't really serve the need that was originally identified? And, and by that, I mean if if we if we come to the conclusion that um, pace is offering a solution that's even better than having to get in your car and drive to another parking lot and then wait for a bus to come pick you up and then that bus takes you to the train station then maybe we have identified a lower cost easier to implement solution and we really just need to promote the heck out of it i have a question what was the original goal the original goal we were going to um uh identify an area where, whether it's a private parking lot or a public parking lot, um, where people could park and then um, get transportation to either the Aurora train station or the Geneva train station. And the hopes was just the 
just getting more people to a centralized location and economic development around that area or what? It was to avoid the inconvenience of having to um, find parking at the congested metro station parking lots. I would think it'll be pretty busy. You need a big parking lot. There's a lot of commuters in Batavia. Yes. I would. I think. I. I think it's not a bad idea at all. I mean, I would think. You know. Again, I. You know. In the first ward, you have the the Batavia apartments. People they walk downtown now. A lot of them do not have vehicles. A lot of these folks, and this will give them an opportunity to find employment also. Yes. So you're walk. saying the pace service or a parking lot? I think a parking lot is good for a pace service. I thought that's what you meant. Um, no, actually. So Pace said that um, when we met with them, <coughs> they said that the park and ride lots in our town situation are not typically um, successful, but that's why they created this so that an individual commuter can get a ride to the train station and back. And, and by the same token, we need to, and that's why we have those trifolds that were right. delivered to the aldermen because um, at Batavia Apartments, they can just call a number and be picked up themselves and brought wherever I they want to. They don't that. have to go to another place. I thought you were changing that for all the commuters also. So I'm sorry. I oh, no, it's an available service. <clears throat> I think it kind of replaces the city of Batavia having to either lease or purchase land, build a parking lot, build infrastructure where people can stand and wait for buses and then try to convince Pace that they should come and pick people up. Alderman Meitzler? So, so as I remember this one, um, it came to fruition because the ridership on Metro lines and, and myself, I ride out of UP West line, so out of Geneva, um, the ridership year over year is going up. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're seeing commuters locate themselves and their families further and further out from the city limits of Chicago. Um, so the idea here was to get a parking lot in place in time so that as this expansion of ridership and even even Metro is looking to add yet a third rail on that mm -hmm. set of lines for both the freight and commuter, um, as, as this ridership increases that we're prepared to help those commuters get into the city and, and be a friendly for commuter town. Um, I like the idea of having a, a, I guess I want to say a larger use parking lot that would to my mind double um, on commuting days obviously for those that are looking to get downtown and back but also we get to the weekends where people are not commuting downtown as much it's there and available for people to come and frequent our downtown and stop in and shop and have dining and experiences and whatnot um, and we've certainly all had the messages and emails and phone calls about how we need to have more parking in the city that aside, I, I think it's good to continue on, on investigating this. I'm not sure what Pace is proposing here or, or as, you know, um, getting to where I believed we were looking, but maybe it is a decent start. When we presented the idea of having a parking <coughs> lot um, for commuters, they said that's not a model that they have found successful because people aren't interested in making the car trip over there and then waiting for the bus and and going up right. um, where they do find it successful is this ride on the shoulder program that they've created uh, which you park at 90 and Randall Road and you get on a bus and you end up at O'Hare Airport yeah. that uh, avoiding the significant inconvenience of that long ride and unavailability of parking is something that people are willing to park and ride for the only place i've seen it's done as a park <laughs> take a bus to the train station is the bnsf out of neighborville mm -hmm. um and that's simply mm -hmm. a sheer capacity problem right they have on that line right yeah i think um what elliot was saying is that the parking lot was more designed for thinking longer term with as crowded as it is right now if you get there for by the 710 train you you're already going right. to be hard pressed to find any parking um even in the lot across the street um so as we know as the ridership keeps increasing because all of the jobs continue to go downtown mm -hmm. um we're going to have a parking problem in that area um while the 
pace option is intriguing, it will not make anybody give up their car to go for this alternative because it is double the price to park. It's just sheer economics. It's 225 to park, it's 237 to park all day, and you would have to do round trips, so you're you've doubled your cost and you're not you're not going to do that. For Are you anticipating that the um, parking <coughs> that we would provide would be at no cost to those It's that not park that it there? wouldn't be at a cost, but it could be at a reduced cost. Mm -hmm. So making it much more likely that you could have um, that last uh, gap go in there. It might not be Metra that's going to offer it, but there might be other alternatives where it could be a, when I was originally thinking it, it could be a centralized lot where then people can take one car over there instead of five people all driving five cars. You park them there and then drive over uh, in the one car. Um, and where these, unfortunately, where these lots have existed, people just prefer to take their car to that point where they're going to be taking the train if they have to get there earlier to not be the guy at 710 who's out of luck. Um, and that was why thinking longer term, it's going to start getting where it's going to be the 650, the 635, mm -hmm. where it's going to be continuing to get full because there is, there is right now there is no incentive for anybody to give up wanting to be the people to get there. If it means that they've got to catch a little bit earlier, all of your downtown people are gone after 710 because it gets down there at 8 o'clock. Most people start at 8 o'clock. Those that start at 9, they're probably thinking different options, which would be maybe going to Geneva mm -hmm. or um, Aurora because the reason why that is, it's got much more parking than Geneva. Or West Chicago has. I've or done West, West Chicago, Chicago all the time because that never, I've gone there at <clears throat> 9 and the main parking lot still has spots. Yep. So I guess my struggle with it is that spending the money on the infrastructure, I, just, I don't see it. I see it in it works in Oswego because they're a long way away from mm -hmm. the, the train. Mm -hmm. It works. You see it up in um, Michigan. It, you see it up in Wisconsin a lot too. You're mm -hmm. going up and you see these park and ride lots and there's 10, 15 cars there. That's not a lot. I don't even know what it takes to really make it um, even close to being worthwhile that people are going to use it and what kind of cost that is. And is the, is the bus going to be free? I mean, is it, what's the, there's still got to be a cost. I imagine the cost is going to be more than driving to West Chicago or Aurora or somewhere else and a little bit more inconvenience. But I went to West Chicago because it was too inconvenient to go to, mm -hmm. to, or to, go to Geneva. So I, I think it's more for the people that don't necessarily have the money for a car call pace and get a, a, a small a cheap ride there rather than hey i have a car and i don't I have to go drive somewhere to take a bus somewhere talk about time investment that's pretty it's a pretty big investment in time in my opinion i was gonna say i, I was completely gung-ho on this idea I, I used to have to commute downtown i remember what the process was like but it took doug saying out loud from their research, people don't want to go to a parking lot to wait for a bus to be taken to a train station. So when I, when I heard him say it, I was like, yeah, that's an extra 25 minutes probably on, on my commute. Doesn't Metra, doesn't the, doesn't the rail line have sort of long-term plans for increasing parking at individual stations when it's necessary? I know it took a long time, but Geneva ultimately did expand their parking when it was when it was necessary and i used to have to be that guy that had to wake up an extra half hour early yeah or i knew i was not going to get a spot right now geneva's is going to be reduced mm -hmm. because they're going to be putting third line right right the, oh shoot that's right south side of the track. so and one as of the i understand that the parking is geneva's not metro's right. right right so one of the things that i want to mention and it's it's the first uh comment up here is that uh there have been several news articles reporting that uber is um really uh, getting busy launching the last mile options as well. And that may be a way that this problem gets solved even better because the Uber cars are everywhere, everywhere waiting to be contacted. Um, and I think it, it, Lake County, right now they're rolling out a program in Lake County that's not so far 
from here, and we know that Uber just moved their headquarters to the uh, old post office building in Chicago. So I think it makes it even more likely that they're going to have a focus on the Chicagoland area. Did you have a um, I think thinking long term, as more and more people are moving out here and wanting to take the train, um, that maybe we focus our land use decisions around the existing um, bus routes that go that do service um i think we have do we have one that goes to aurora's or just yes. geneva's there's a bus line that goes to aurora's. the 801 and the 802 okay so we do we do get to both of them so centralizing our own you know or focusing some housing and some development along those routes so that people have options that want to be able to take the bus the more people that take the bus the more regular those are going to run the more investment that goes into them the better that they will be i think that's probably more the wave of the future than than making a big parking lot for people where you're just inducing more you're just inducing more car travel you're just inducing more of those single vehicle single occupancy vehicles you're never going to be able to catch up it's just going to keep going until we've paved over the entire city that model doesn't work right now What's it that? takes an hour to, to get, get from that really? bus stop to Aurora. I've, I've timed out what it's like. This is your last resort yeah. to get to uh, Metro. You will not be using this because you're commuting every morning. I would never take an hour and a half bus in the morning to get on a train. Mile, never yeah. would do it. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a big limitation for someone who's, that's their only option. I mean, we're, I we're strapping them down. I agree. So and I think we need we're, more buses. Mm -hmm. I think we're, that's where we're, we're focused on. I think thinking, a little bit shorter term we're not really thinking what the problem is going to be is there's just not going to be enough parking at geneva right. people will not stop going to geneva right. until it doesn't make economic sense mm -hmm. they'll want to be dropped off right they'll they'll want to be dropped off the you can go to west chicago or la fox there is large empty lots there but people will not do that because it's going to be the um it's just not cost effective mm -hmm. time money wise when we keep talking about you know buying lots and setting up well we can't make it free and so on and so forth it's like why wouldn't we why wouldn't we figure out where centralized places are for people to park because now if people don't have to pay the parking per day and they've got a centralized spot that is closer where then they can carpool that does take away from less traffic on the roads on the arterials going into and out of geneva um, and you have them more centralized into an area but that also does not mean that the city has to buy it they can get into some private partnerships with people that have large lots that aren't using it that maybe they can the um you know take uh, out at target where we have huge parking lots out there right now corral a section off it's free parking everybody can just meet up there at a certain time you take one or two cars and people will start saying well now it makes sense that i don't have to pay for parking and but no people one could do that today without us making any investment and people can take this out there but mm -hmm. we're not putting options out there because people are notorious creatures of habit they're going to take mm -hmm. the path of least resistance if you can start showing them that they're going to make money more money in their pockets they will be more inclined to do that than while it might seem like a great idea for pace or for the the ride you're automatically somebody's going to go this is going to cost me double i'm not going to do it no matter what even if my car's in the shop i'll make do for a little bit but but you're bringing up you said um people will take the path of least <coughs> resistance and i when i look at the train station being a mile away if i'm driving to a parking lot and waiting for a bus people might see that as more resistance than just right but i'm not there. saying that's why i'm not saying the bus i'm saying other creative ways where people can work together to share those costs about the um the the van yeah. rideship program exactly and so is that's very another pace program is very successful mm -hmm. you could somebody could do the van ride instead of going from place to place to place picking people up people can just go and what we're talking about, the solutions aren't designed for the person that lives the one mile away. There is not going to be that 
difference. But the people that start living over on the west side of town, where it takes a long time to get through town, it might give them pause to start thinking about creative different ways, especially when we get more people coming in for, um, you know, all the workers at Fermilab. Right. Those are going to be people that are going to need to get to the train. So, so that goes hand in hand with the economic incentive and all those incentivizers will have to, with an eye towards, there's going to be a force of this at some point because there's not going to be the parking. No matter what you do, there's not, you can only put enough people into the same bag. If the solution already exists, do we need to find another one? We're not, but when we designed this, it was like Elliot said, we started thinking for these things for the planning for future, right. not the solutions for that already exist today. But We're I think starting these to will address that if the problem in the future is that parking doesn't exist and we need to find a way to get people from here to there, like you said, the carpooling, that's a solution that already exists. So if you know, if we're trying to create a parking lot where people can meet and then create form groups where they're all going to the same place, this is a program that already exists within the PACE program. They will, they will drop off the um, vehicle for the person who is the driver to use and where everybody's going to congregate and then go from there. I think Dan is... is was pretty accurate on that. I, I think, you know, a couple more dollars in the morning or afternoon, it's not that major. I think the real currency is time. Yeah. That's, you know, that's what people want. Yeah. I mean, in the morning, I mean, you just want to get to work. You don't exactly. want to take two hours when it should only be a one-hour train ride. Right. Yeah, I would say that from, from our seats, I feel like our power is in land use and setting up our city so that it's easy for people to get around. Um, and I think doing anything that incentivizes just more driving, then we're doing our city a disservice. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can't, I can't see a car, I can't see a parking lot, a designated parking lot, being a, a, a wave of the future. But high density housing near public transportation that already exists or expansions that are already planned. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. And I, I can walk to a bus from my house. Me too. If there were more buses, I would. And I and I only <laughs> would choose to live when I picked sure. out our neighborhood. I would only live where I could do sure. that. And I think that's going to be the demand of people that want to work downtown and live out in the suburbs. That's going to be something they're looking for. So that's that's what we need to cater to. I don't think we need to cater to people that want to drive from went down. One of the things that I thought about a lot about this when we first talked about this was, first of all, how many commuter cars that sit up at the Geneva train station. Are single drivers mm -hmm. with no passenger and it's a huge number mm -hmm. um, I talked to some people from my church and other places that I know that are lifelong commuters you know they've been working downtown Chicago for 40 50 years that they've been in and out on the train and have lived in different places and one of the things that they commented about that the whole time they were a commuter they were single commuters they never paired up with anybody unless it was somebody had you know a situation where they either moved out of a house, got divorced, whatever happened, where they needed help to do that. Other than that, it was always a single driver. I think that's the bigger problem that we have with the lot up there. And the, the problems that we have in town here is there's no group commuting anywhere around here. You know, and that, to me, would be a bigger thing that I think we should push rather than trying to find a property owner that's willing without making anything from it, to donate a property for parking. I just don't think that'll ever happen. You're not going to go out to Target and convince them that 20% of their lot's going to get used for parking. I just don't ever see that happening. I mean, every property manager out there and every business out there wants to make something from their property. And they're not just going to give up 50 spaces so that we can have a parking lot for free for people to use. There's also liability involved in that. So I don't know that that's ever going to happen. Um, I think the biggest thing we need to look at is where we're going to be in 20 or 25 years. Are we going to have short track commuter service between Aurora and Batavia and Geneva and Elgin? Um, 
you know, I think that that's really where it's going to go. It's not going to go into, hey, we're going to have a commuter park and ride lot that's going to solve our traffic problems out here. Our traffic problems will be solved by some type of public transportation that connects those things. I mean, it, it's really crazy to think that we go back 50 or 100 years and it probably we was better that. off <laughs> when we had the Aurora and Elgin running up and down the side of the river where it connected those towns. And honestly, to me, that's where it could be. We've got the right of way. If you were to put that back up there and run a CTA like train from Aurora to Elgin, it could connect all that stuff and you could get to the commuter rail lines to get to Chicago. So I think in the big picture, long term, that's where I see this going. I don't think we should spend a lot more time or I don't think we should spend any money going further with this when there are partial solutions that are there and things to plan to get us further into the future are things we have to work at and it's going to take a lot of pressure from this council and other councils to convince the broke state to be able to do anything like that so that's where i think this is going no but just from listening to everybody talk though wouldn't it be interesting if metro required for certain sections of their parking mm -hmm. you could now park there unless you had at least three people in your vehicle they you do get free parking if you bring four people. they do a similar thing with the commuter lanes and other sure. cities and other states, you know, where you can't drive a car if you're a single driver in it, you have to have multiple people in it. So, I, and I think that's also a requirement. I remember if it's in California when I was out there that there are parking lots at rail stations where it has to be commuter parking. You have to have at least two people in the car to park in that lot. Something for them to investigate. Well, and I think the problem there is they're not all metro controlled lots. First, Geneva is Geneva's lot, so they get to make the rules on it. Metro doesn't. Too bad we don't know nobody in Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could bet him on it. <laughs> and we could win. Any other Sorry. comments on this? A few voices we haven't heard from. Yeah, I, I, uh, I see. The, the issue is the last, the first and the last mile. Yeah. <laughs> um, to use figure cars into that and individuals driving cars doesn't solve the problem long term. I think there are some things that are coming down, you know, driverless cars, um, that technology is all not that far off. Um, looking at, I'm, I'm a, you know, the, the Uber last mile, um, pace, I think, you know, bringing public transportation back to that last mile, that salute, that has to be the salute. Because anything short of that doesn't accomplish what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce congestion. And encourage people to travel together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, so if the question that, that you had asked, you know, exploring this model of a parking lot where people drive to and then get transported from there, sure, that's public transportation, but only part of it. It's going to be public transportation for the whole, whole thing if we're going to have a true solution. So I think one of the things um, that we can do is um, promote the heck out of the options that um, have been identified and exist today. Um, always be continuing the conversation about what new and innovative ways <coughs> there might be to get people from here to the train stations without having to park at the train stations. Um, to include making efforts to get um, our area of Chicago land in front of Uber as the next potential area to roll out their last mile solutions. Would that be a good way forward? Be helpful. Okay. And I think anything that we do trying to get people to use any service that PACE provides gives them more of a reason to expand their service. Right. I mean, we've always heard that from them, that any time they come out here, well, if we put the bus line out here mm -hmm. and nobody rides it, nobody rides it, they're not going to increase it. If right. they load the buses up and use them all the time, they're going to add more routes. They're going to add more frequent routes to be able to handle that. So I think that's where we should push this. As it is, the on-demand is, is, does not encompass the entire community. Its next expansion would be right. to add more, more people, people to it. Right. It leaves out tremendous amounts of, uh, of the first ward. It's not, they're not even part of it. Right, and that's, that's kind of my whole point with what we think is the solution isn't really a solution because it's only going to those areas where yeah. 
the demand doesn't really exist for it in those numbers. Because if the demand already existed, then we would have more routes. We would have those more last mile options. We don't have that because I think it's not, it, there's no incentive right. for, for pace to increase. Mm -hmm. There is also, by not promoting the private side of it, which is the, la the Uber, is really the way to go. Not the, there isn't going to be the uh, last mile public transportation for here. We just will never have that density for it. So by not having the density, not having the demand, and not having the incentive for people to give up their cars, they're still going to give, they're still going to go to Geneva. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't done anything. When I was talking about um, you know, the target or this or that, I'm not saying to do it. I'm saying we don't need to buy a lot. I agree exactly with what, um, with what Abby was saying. We don't need to build a lot. We don't need to purchase any lots. We don't need to do any of that. We need to see what's available out there and encourage the Uber side of it which does then take away for that last mile mm -hmm. and geneva should raise that if you've got more than um mm -hmm. if you've got one person you can't park in the garage sorry you can't park in the garage you have to park across the street there's no incentive to do it otherwise because there is nobody that is riding two people in a car there's, it just Does anybody exist. know anybody in Geneva? <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to them about but that. But that's why it's, yeah. it's not going to get a, go away, and that's why this was originally brought up, because it's to going to get worse. <laughs> right. And when, to Abby's point, since she wasn't at the original discussion, it was what do we see problems on the horizon mm -hmm. that we want to encourage? Well, it's all of the things that you would have supported, which was decreasing the traffic, decreasing um, trips back and forth, and increasing uh, public transportation. Mm -hmm. We just have to think about it a little bit differently, but it's more probably in the Uber side of it than anything else, the Uber, uh, Uber pool. Okay. Maybe they could pilot something. Yeah. And I, and I don't know that it really matters to Geneva. They're getting paid for each space that they have there, so they don't yeah. care how many people are in the car. <laughs> yep. You know, if they were doing it by head count, maybe it would make sense. And they won't care. Well, that's the right thing to do. And uh, more cars there means more people to buy that delicious, delicious coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think I've got good direction there. Um, the next objective is the second bridge. That's that's just a walloping one, and I mm -hmm. I think that we all agree that if it were the case that the city of Batavia would have to foot the bill for 100% for building that bridge, that that's probably not something that's in our future. Um, and so the direction given in the last presentation was to uh, work with neighbors, work with the county to uh, develop more of a regional transportation solution. Maybe that means that our second bridge moves a little further south than we had first anticipated, but to continue those conversations going forward to see what uh, lies ahead. And I know that if Mayor was here, <laughs> he would tell us that um, grant funding is certainly not something to be counted on. Um, so collaboration may be the key to this being a feasible objective for us. But yet we thought we were gonna pay for the Prairie Street and Wilson Street construction mm -hmm. in total and we got money for that. Mm -hmm. That was lucky. <laughs> We have enterprise it. funds, we have capital funds, we have all kinds of different funds. We do not have a fund for a bridge. We should establish a line item for the bridge. We determine if it's a penny or two pennies and keep making contributions into that account. Whether we're going to spend that money or not, if we're not saving it, we are not spending it, we are not prioritizing mm -hmm. that a bridge is happening. Whether we're paying for our own bridge in our own town or whether we are saving up for a contribution for a regional solution. There has to be a fund set up in the 2020 budget. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. And, and that could also be used for rebuilding this one when it needs sure. 50 years from now. But if we're not specifically putting two cents aside or a penny aside, we're, we're making zero progress. Mm -hmm. 
that should come up in the budget. I would yeah. wholeheartedly yeah. agree with that. Yeah. So, but the that's what you said. I would absolutely agree with that, and I guess I would only add on to that that it's it's not just the building of the bridge that we need to fund. It's also the engineering studies. It's yeah. probably property purchasing along the way yes. because I mean you just it doesn't take much to look at a Google map and try to figure out what is a good way to get east west where you're actually connecting it beyond mm -hmm. 31 and 25 and not funneling the traffic right back up to the same sore points. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be purchasing property. It's going to be more than just the cost to build a bridge. You just made my point better. It's not one or two pennies. It's probably four or five pennies. <laughs> I think what I don't want to do necessarily, though, is earmark funds to say these five pennies are going to a bridge. I would say these five pennies are going to a, some sort of infrastructure improvement because it could be the dam because that could just happen to us without – that could fail on its own, and then we'd have no money. Or we're saying, okay, we got to put four cents here and four cents here and four cents here, and we don't have any more pennies left to do anything else. So I wouldn't want to pigeonhole ourselves into something where all of a sudden, you know, some miracle comes along, or we have a you know a senator that sets up shop in, in Batavia and decides to you know donate us a bridge at some point. Then we've said, oh, we earmarked this money for the bridge and we can't do anything else well, with it or whatever. It's, 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 it's funny you say that. Under the yes. section under the river, I was going to recommend another two-penny fund under that as mm -hmm. well, too. <laughs> Those are two projects that need to be funded. We are still not prioritizing them. And if we keep thinking we're going to take it from the general fund, nothing is ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're right. We need a second fund for the dam as well. We need to discipline ourselves. Mm -hmm. when we we're put not. it into infrastructure, but we don't rate it. Exactly. We identified another project. There's uh, riverfront stabilization. Right. That's another fund, and we have not funded that one at all. Um, there's the um, enterprise funds inside of each of the utilities, but we've already identified that we are falling further and further and further behind, so we're not even funding our existing funds that have already been set up. That's the purpose of this discussion. And that was kind of my question, too, after just listening to the budget conversations to hear how many funds were not um, fully funding, if we're adding more infrastructure to the funds that we're not funding, how are we going to fund those in the future? So how do we, if we're going to build this big bridge and all the roads that go to it, but we're not currently, it's kind of like, I'm going to, I'm not going to make my house payments, but I'm going to go buy a condo somewhere. I just, I, I'm confused how the math works. It's a, it's a great way of looking at it. I think uh, Dave Brown, before he left, said, Every time we build something, we need to factor in how are we going to take care of it forever mm -hmm. now that it exists. And so it's not even just the what it takes to bring it to fruition, but it's what does it take to take care of it now mm -hmm. and in the future. Ellen, Marty, how much have we spent on studies before for the bridge? Not too much. Enough to get us to the point where we went out to referendum, cited a bridge, and yeah. passed yeah, not half million. Really not. Easily half million. And what happened with that? Got beat in the referendum. Voters said no. Got beat in the referendum. It goes to kind of the same line of thinking. Why would we put any more money towards saving for a bridge or studying for a bridge if we don't put it out for referendum again to find out what people want to do with the bridge well in the, in the biggest issue and because i was here through there's all enough that, there are people that are here that i don't know if we need another bridge because it might not do what we're wanting it to do and one of the issues if you go anything further than the four choices we had just to the south of here you run into a little green fish about this long that prohibits us from building anything between moose heart road and where our old south dam was because of the green snail darter that's in the river and you cannot put another footprint in the river by doing that so that leaves you about four blocks south of here is the shortest crossing which you can span the river without putting a piling in the river it's which, that's ordinance. really the only place you can build a bridge <laughs> but is there but can anybody say that there is do we know what people are willing to build for a bridge? No, because we don't have a plan to build in probably the only place we could. We do kind of. We, by ordinance, created the first Webster Corridor. 
That's what that we, is correct. We, we right, communicated right. that was but about I seven got years ago. Told us already in this room, right there, the directors stood here and told us they will not allow the bridge to be built there because you have a state route 25 that they cannot put a left-hand turn lane at between one in a one block span it's too close and they said they would not approve that so if you don't have a left-hand turn lane then you end up with a one-way bridge for sure. which there's no way you're going to sell that to the public well it's a generation <laughs> later 20 years later maybe it is time for a an, another mm -hmm. another look at this uh, because the the numbers have changed the people have changed mm -hmm. that's why we have a whole bunch of divided neighborhoods with, with, what, Sorry. with what we went through the last time yeah. Uh, the people on Webster and the people on First Street and then the people on Cleveland Avenue and there was all, Pine Street. Everybody had their own anti-group. Mm -hmm. And you remember that. Oh, they yeah. were all down here screaming and hollering. And so when we finally did pick the one at Webster and First and Water and First or whatever we want to call it, uh, that was done largely because George Ryan had just been elected governor of Illinois and he put $6 million dollars into the deal to rebuild the intersections at Webster and River and Batavia Avenue and First Street. And he was going to put traffic signals up and all this other good stuff. So we had this six million dollars three million on each side of the river to tie it to the state highways. That was the idea. But we lost that obviously when the referendum was was failed. So that was that was the course of least resistance it was one where we did have for lack of a better description a direct route going across the river we city owned the property the electrical substation some of that would have had to been moved but we owned the right away over there on webster going up the river but you know then have people say well it's too close to the wilson street bridge and et cetera, et cetera. so i mean we tried and but it, it you know it went down with i believe better than 60 percent of the people voted against it well I, you know what and it did but that and the 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 dam i mean we had the, the city had funds to to do this had funds to do the dam and so when 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 marty said you know we'll leave it to the people in a referendum i mean we we have now a home rule council here and not that we know any more than anybody else and it's not our desire but we do the readings and we're a representative government here that that you know that referendum is what killed it and what started the referendum is that two dozen people in town so it's the same two dozen people who say they don't want to spend any money and then they all put out false information and half truths and people who are home before who, facebook before face before <laughs> facebook with with those half truths people sit at home they're raising their kids they're going to ball games they're not following it and they just see this and you get some of these people knocking on doors spreading the the the, the falsehoods and so people do they sign the document yeah i'll i'll, I'll put it to referendum so uh, referendums it's 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 a tool but we got to be really careful in, in in saying well we can always put it to the people they don't do the readings you guys do they don't sit in these meetings talking about this. Are you asking for an advisory re referendum to see whether we should build it in the first place? An advisory referendum to see where we should cite it or if we should even study it again? And we've done that. Or are you asking for an advisory referendum? Are you, as a Batavian, willing to raise your taxes four cents to pay for, to pay for this thing? All three of those referendums would have very different outcomes. Well, and that's why I think it's not, it's not throwing it out to referendum to see what we think they want to spend the money or not. The public already said no, they don't want to do it. They said it a generation ago, though. Ex so. Yes, exactly. But the other part about that is re-asking them so that there is not the buy, or so that you do have the buy-in of what you're talking about generationally. Now, um, I know Abby and I have discussed what are we trying to accomplish by putting in a downtown bridge what does that actually mean and could it be impacting and harming the very monies that we've been spending since that last referendum we've spent all this money on river street on all the streetscapes so that we build another bridge so that people can get faster through downtown so they can bypass our downtown that's 
disingenuous to what we've been doing in the downtown for the last 10, 15 years. To all of a sudden now say everything that we've been doing that has been working, let's throw it out the window because we want people to go through the downtown doesn't make fiscal sense to do it when it goes against everything, all of the goals and comprehensive plans that we've been working on. Um, I just, I, as a resident, don't understand why we would not want to say, if the direction of the community wants to do that, then yeah. we'll make the downtown the bypass. Well, the and circulator is what won. The bypass, the bypass yeah, didn't right. win. It was the circulator. So if you want to make a change to the type of bridge that there is, then you're right. But that said, if we're trying to clear up traffic downtown and there are people that simply do not want to shop the downtown and they need to bypass it, I think it's okay to let them bypass if they need to. Then we already have those in North Aurora and Fabian. Fair enough, which is why and, the circulators would. And so are we building the 3.30 to 5 o'clock bridge? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're spending $40 million on, an hour and a half bridge, that it would maybe make it a little less congested. But if you've done all of the research and the studies, the more infrastructure you add, it doesn't all of a sudden become country lanes opening it all up. It makes that have more people go through. So now we've got two bridges that are packed and it just keeps building. Then people are going to be start saying, well, where's the third bridge to do this? Why can't we be like St. Charles that has three bridges going through? Um, the more you read about it and the psychology of it, we need to dial back what we've been doing for 50 years has gotten us to the sure, point. For sure, but it all three work. of those bridges are very different. And to their credit, they paid for that red gate. <laughs> right. They set aside that's the, 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 the two cents fund. That's the fourth bridge. For sure, for sure. Then they got laughed at for the uh, Prairie Bridge. That's the one. That's the only one I take now. I don't even take the 64 one. And that's the um, street that I lived on. That street was always empty. That bridge was empty. Can I just make a suggestion here? Because it sounds like we're debating whether we need a bridge or whether we don't need a bridge, whether the bridge should be downtown or whether it should be further down south, whether it should be a bypass or whether it should be a circulator. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest that as opposed to putting those types of questions to referendum and risking uh, Brexit like decisions yeah, right. <laughs> where people go, what's this question here on my ballot? And you don't really have an informed opinion about it to host community discussion about the need for a second bridge and present ideas about should it be downtown or should it be further south? Do we really need it? And then maybe the people who feel passionately about one position or another can can express those opinions. <coughs> And maybe bring information that we haven't heard before. It's it's begging for another subcommittee with all with all due respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those will be marathon meetings. Well, it, it deserves its own subcommittee because if it is something that we are going to tackle, if it is something we're thinking about funding, um, people who are passionate about it should be able to speak and actually council members who feel passionate about it. Uh, should be able to join and help and, help and guide I think that discussion. It's, it's also something that we should use the data that we already have, even if it is ten years old. Mm -hmm. It may need should some updating. Bring it out. Well, what was the data that Gary pre presented at the mid-year report? Didn't he say what was it at the peak times? It adds yeah. five or seven minutes. Yeah. Right. Yes. So the travel time increases at peak times five to seven minutes to get across town. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then it takes nine minutes to get from Van Buren to Prairie instead of mm -hmm. four. four. Which will change with the traffic. Van Buren, Van Norwick, right? Van Norwick, Van Norwick. Yeah. In either case, <laughs> in either case, I can't. I, this to me just becomes a budget question. And and quite honestly, with all the other things that we know, we have not yet started a funding for. Right. Mm -hmm. The first thing I'm going to say, I am not willing to sign up to spend any more money on, mm -hmm. is the discussion or plans for a second bridge downtown. When even amongst us as a council, we can't even come to a halfway margin here. Let alone think that we need to have a lot of community discussion first on. So this thing is not a 2019 item. Obviously, it's certainly not a 2020 item in my opinion either. It's going to get kicked further down the road and and if we think we're finding money for that now when we have all these other things like the dam and the infrastructure and the riverbank stabilization let alone all the things that we want to do to revitalize downtown 
not going to happen. No, this so is to important. me, this is just wasting time and money and resources. Well, no, this is important discussion. The objective, the title of the objective says create a plan for a possible bridge. We still need to do that. We need to spend some time doing that, whether it's this committee or another committee that does that. We don't necessarily have to fund it today, but we do need to create a plan for a, a possible. Are, I, do we all agree on that? We need a plan. Uh, no. I, I don't know that we, we do. No. <laughs> then we should just we should devote a meeting to that and discuss that and figure mm -hmm. this out. And that should the be the next step in this plan. I feel comfortable saying no. It came up when I was canvassing a handful of times. I would say maybe five times people asked me what's your opinion of the bridge? And I was always very honest that I, don't, I am not in favor of a second bridge. And I would say there, I think there was one, one out of five disagreed with me. But four were like, yeah, we totally feel the same. They were here for the time before. Um, so I, I feel comfortable in my position, but it's not a representative sample of the fifth ward. So I would go out and get more. But, you know, I, I felt confident expressing that at the forum, I feel confident expressing it now. I, I, I think there are a lot of loud voices that are very grumpy about nine minutes across town. <laughs> and I'm the, I think it's a more silent, you know, people that are fine with it that no nine minutes isn't really that bad of traffic. Those people should go drive on 59 through Naperville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's why people leave DuPage story. County and come out here is because they don't want to sit on 59 and do that. I'm going to, public I mean, and, I'm going to Phoenix And I'll say I can make it from the, the middle map, school like, to the high school in 11 minutes the yeah. at, at 5 o'clock at night. <laughs> so, so where we're at on this, it sounds like um, there are a majority of voices who say if Batavians alone are going to pay for this bridge and it's going to be close to downtown, that there isn't a lot of support around the table for that solution. That was why my initial suggestion is, knowing from talking to people on here, I don't think there, I think if we've left it up to the council right now, it would be no on a second bridge. Mm -hmm. I think that what we would do is if we're going to put it out, and it doesn't have to be a referendum, just we need to have overwhelming public input from the public saying we want a second bridge. I don't care about them saying whether or not they're going to fund it. Just do we want a public bridge? Because a lot of us have kind of informed ourselves about the dynamics of what that second bridge will do. And it won't accomplish the goals that we think it's going to. There's been enough new studies on that that are now showing it would actually detract from what we've accomplished. And we don't want to do that. Induced demand is yep. what it's called. Yep. Can we, can I, I we set add, it for a public? Oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. I would add to that. Or, or, you know, the talk of having a second bridge could take away from what we're trying to accomplish. I get that. But also... We have to plan like we're going to be very successful in bringing more people mm -hmm. downtown, and that's going to congest things further. Um, in Only terms of a guys. plan, yes, we definitely should. We need to have a plan, whether whatever that plan is. But I thought from our last discussion, the the direction we were going was uh, looking at regional options, mm -hmm. because the idea yeah. of us footing a bill for forty million dollars right now without help from anywhere else, mm -hmm. you know. In a word, don't fall. Don't yeah. <laughs> but we, we don't even so, have our contribution but, for that. Yeah. That's, that was my, we don't even have that contribution. Yeah, right. Even if we're talking about a regional one, we have zero to put into that. Mm -hmm. So. You know, not, oh, go ahead. I, I really feel like, too, if it's a downtown, somewhat circulator, somewhat bypass, I, what I've always thought is a hybrid, if it's far enough away from Wilson Street, but not far enough to become a true bypass that really frames the downtown mm -hmm. and then when you want to redevelop south of here that really frames where you think you're going to go with downtown and to me that's 15 20 years from now what does the downtown look like you know i i think of st charles 20 years ago with one bridge or 30 years ago with one bridge across downtown and as they moved and their downtown has changed look at what it looks like now with the density that's downtown so that's something that 20 30 years from now that can be one of the things that a bridge does to a downtown i don't think it's going to kill the downtown i think it will frame the downtown so that's where i think that should go 
How about a uh, discussion? We can identify first or second quarter of next year to have this as a discussion item on um, a cow agenda so that we can get um, uh, some idea of the direction that we want to go in in terms of uh, yes, no, bridge, downtown, or further south, make it a regional solution. and. We can kind of get some public opinion fed into the direction. Perfect. I would like to do that. What happened to our community surveys? Couldn't that be that going You're Stealing out? my thunder. <laughs> More about community surveys later. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> then that could be one of the questions. That's why she didn't that put a memo be out. It's because she buried that in this. Um, the next objective is identify and enhance safe walking, biking routes to and through downtown. And the action item number one was work with Geneva to explore a sidewalk connection to the metro station. Initially, after meeting with Geneva, we determined that this isn't really practical if no pedestrian crossing is, exists at the um, intersection of Fabian Parkway and, um, and Batavia Avenue. Uh, however, then we were called into a meeting with the Kane County chairman, uh, wherein he uh, committed to doing the phase one engineering for a solution to that intersection and the drawings that we were shown identified that a crosswalk would be put in now so that's need, just need to go talk to geneva about will they support it yes they will we actually did sit down with them and they said yes they would support it um but it the it wasn't feasible until it wasn't really going to help batavians get up to that geneva um, sidewalk because there was no crosswalk and there for them to get to, to it too. Yes. Well, yeah. Campana has already got the sidewalk that they're was up. built 40 years ago. Yeah, but they, they're, they're going to be losing land. land. That's why they need to be on board. Right. And, and I think that again, this is long-term planning and if the possibility exists when they redo the intersection, I think it's something we have to be open to and we have to be working towards that. Because again, this is not just <coughs> next year or five years from now. This is 20 or 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. You want to know where the exact location of the Batavia Geneva <laughs> boundary is to the inch? It's the end of that sidewalk. Of <laughs> How long is it from downtown Batavia to the train station? Geneva. I want to say it's almost two miles. It's a four dollar from Uber. Wilson Street. Yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> From my house. So the identified cost of um, that improvement, and who knows when it would happen in the future, but the estimated cost would be uh, two hundred thousand. And that's in Geneva. Um, yes. I would have a real problem with Octavia spending money to build a sidewalk. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I can understand that um, if it wasn't a um, benefit to us, but we just spent. 35 minutes talking about a solution to assist our commuters to get to the Geneva train station. And so it, it's up to you um, whether you, it was identified as mm -hmm. an action. We can take it off if you want and yeah. say if it's. We're doing enough to our downtown and, and enticing people to come to it that it might be a benefit for Geneva to come to Batavia. I agree. Those are going to be Batavians walking on that sidewalk, though. I, I, I would be very interested to hear what the, the elected officials in the city of Geneva would say about them paying for a sidewalk coming down Batavia Avenue. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an enlightened conversation. <laughs> well, and I think that that's something that from uh, past experience that we've had downstate with IDOT, anytime you can show the ability of a pedestrian to get to the commuter rail station <clears throat> that qualifies for CMAC? Which one of the grants it is? CMAC, the uh, through the state congestion re reduction to re to reduce congestion, and that's something that the state will help. Right off the bat, they said they would pay for engineering if you can show that that's right. a direct link to it. If the Fox River split Batavia into two different communities, and one side had money and the other one didn't, you'd be sure the side that had the money and the interest in bringing the market over yes. would absolutely pay for that pedestrian bridge. Mm -hmm. No question. Those are Batavians that will be on that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Isn't this discussion how every European war has started? <laughs> <laughs> no, because we haven't talked to anything about religion. Yes, we're going to have to annex them. <laughs> we march on Geneva at dawn. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think 
where we're at um, here is that um, we're waiting for the county to come through on further plans to improve that intersection, but we need to keep in mind that um, potentially there may be an investment we need to make to um, bring that to fruition, but it's not a, it's not a short-term happening, so I don't think it's going to affect our 2020 budget. Um, the second action item was to uh, design and or construct an alternative to stairs on the bike path on the east side of the walking bridge. This, if you remember, was one of the uh, recommendations that came from the stakeholder group that was looking at the next uh, transportation item, which is identifying uh, to create a, the walkability and, and bikeability improvements. Um, this one comes down to whether we feel that it is a problem that is so dire that we need to solve it on our own and or whether knowing that um, future development is going to happen in the area wait until it can be constructed as part of a public private partnership so yes I would say in my mind, the worst problem is the fact that we have a path that runs alongside the river that we can't use. Mm -hmm. And before we even matter? consider working, worrying about what we're going to do with the staircase that's at the end of it that's useless half of the year, we should fix the problem of having the pathway underwater. That would solve all the bike path problems or the bike travel problems along River Street, um, South River Street. The Webster, all those different things would be solved if we would fix the path that we built alongside the river. If that means spending a couple hundred grand in the level that bring that path up two feet so that it's not underwater, even under the highest water we've uh, the dam recorded might take care there. Of that too. <laughs> what? If the dam goes that might take care of that no, too. Well, no. no, the water no, will the never get higher if the dam goes away. <laughs> Get lower? <laughs> no, not on this side of the dam. No. Uh, not on that side of the dam. That, 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 the, the river behind us right here is controlled by the North Aurora Dam, yeah. and that only comes up to about, I think it's about where the cemetery is. Yeah. And then it stops having any, any issues with it. Pretty expensive. I mean. Oh, yeah, I, I, I get that. But to me, it solves the majority of all the problems. It, it, why are we worrying or why are we talking about trying to reroute people on a bike path that we've already built that's alongside the river? Put them back on the bike path where they belong. Fix the bike path so it can be used as a bike path. The whole reason that was put alongside the river was to keep bicyclists off of the street so they didn't have to go through that intersection at 25 and Wilson Street. That's why we built a bike path, correct? I mean, well, you were own, here. I was certainly here right. with the whole thing, but I would tell you that that was looked at, and there's there's a number of engineering issues you get into with that that get raised up. Mm -hmm. there, there's a great fear of some bicyclists falling off of it and going into the river. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's there were several things that came out of that. There was a study done. We must have it here someplace in the building that talked about. It. And the, the steps were, I always argued that we should have put this in some other way to get them up, <laughs> but we didn't have the land at the right, time. There was now no we, space. Now, yeah, now with Larson Becker purchase, we do have the necessary mm -hmm. land to run it up there. And, uh, you know, it, I, I guess I would think if people came down there and it was flooded like it does get, they'll just go back up on the sidewalk on right. River Street. But there would be a time when most, of, I would say, 80% of the year they would be able to use it. In the way it's currently built, I'm not trying to argue right. with you, but I'm just saying that that would be an expensive adjustment that we could use that money to do some other things with. I think those little ramps, the uh, whatever they were yeah. called, Unwalkable. the bike. I think that ramps. Would be a, that would be a nice, just easy addition Interim. until we know what development's going there. Mm -hmm. As I know before the center railing was out there, I did try to take the kids down there one time in the Burley, and that wasn't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody got hurt. <laughs> Just embarrassed. Okay. Um, shall we move on to the uh, next 
action item three was create a plan and funding structure for the future walkability bikeability improvements um, a presentation was previously provided that showed a number of areas where improvements are needed um, also some areas where this year improvements have been made by adding signage um, pavement markings like the sharrows that we put on uh, Island Avenue in Shumway, as well as um, Water Street, and then also the newest addition of pavement markings on Wilson Street, um, letting people to know, know to dismount and walk their bikes over the Donovan Bridge. However, um, we know that there were some other areas that were noted in that report where it is a more uh, complex problem that may only be further solved by uh, development that happens uh, in the area. So I'm not sure if this is uh, something where we need to create a fund now in order to apply to these improvements, or if it's a discussion that will come along with the plans that city council makes for how and when we would like to see areas of our downtown further develop. Um, I would like to see, and I know the bike commission has been talking about updating the bike plan. Um, their, the bike plan was adopted, I think, in 2007. If we look at the, it's, it's old, it's outdated, and it needs some sprucing up. And I've talked to them, too, is about including the, uh, some pedestrian elements into that to just make it an active transportation plan so that we've got... A document that's guiding us and i would love to see us treat our infrastructure budget you know like the state and the feds are starting to do where a chunk of that is dedicated just to pedestrian <coughs> and bike improvements every year because the 100 year plan for sidewalks is just too long <laughs> of a plan to get people walking um, so i actually had thirteen thousand dollars in the um, administration budget for the bicycle commission's um, updating <coughs> of the bicycle plan. Yes. Awesome. So that will be presented for the 2020 budget. Good. Okay. Is that something as we've talked about it and as the stuff we've gone through with Prairie Street and other discussions we've had on the bike um, plan as it was written definitely needs to be updated and definitely needs to be something that we incorporate into all the infrastructure stuff that we plan to do. Mm -hmm. So if we are going to try and reduce, you know, the congestion and the other problems that we have in town if we can you know, I've always thought that every time you get a sidewalk further away from a school that's one or two or three or five less cars that go to that school every day right. to drop somebody off if somebody's gonna walk there yeah. so and just yeah and because you reminded me of that too near um, near JB Nelson and when we talk about Prairie Street and taking mm -hmm. away parking there and I was talking to um, Mary Beth one of the residents that have come and that's come mm -hmm. to talk to us about it all of the side streets where we're telling people well, you can just park on the side street, park on the side street. None of those side streets have parking. She's like, every time somebody parks there, one of my guests come, they're like, I parked in somebody's front yard. I had to walk through somebody's front yard to get to your house. Like, it's really uncomfortable. There's no sidewalks, there's no sidewalks <laughs> where we're telling people to park. So mm -hmm. looking at some of those priority areas, too, when we're working on an entire street, I think will be really important. I think at least one of those streets over there doesn't have curbs. Nothing. Yeah, one, it's it's curbless. It's sidewalkless. It's yeah, just east side. you're in somebody's yard when you get out of your car. So it's <laughs> okay. Um, the the next action item is pursue IDOT approval for a road diet on Batavia Avenue that was added um, since our last time, and in the meantime, we received that response back from IDOT. I don't know if it's I can label it it's looking at it perhaps too positively saying <laughs> encouraging us to engage in the um, the traffic study but um, I think that's something that needs to be part of our budget discussions because we do not currently have funding for that so the decision will need to be made if we're going to expend those resources in order to do those studies necessary to do we make the that argument that traffic study for the first step is 500 grand, you think? That's no, I think it's called? 125. 125, okay. That's what I remembered so I guess when I saw the 500,000. The full engineering would is be that. that. I'd be curious to how extensive 125 gets us because I really think we need to be from Fabian to 
Morton or somewhere Millview. south of there and, to Millview, <laughs> and we need to be Van Nortwick to Prairie on uh, both of those streets. It needs to be extensive because we really need to know the full extent of the traffic when they say there's 14,000 cars. Mm-hmm. That reading is like a Fabian. But where do those people peel off the road? Right. Where do they get on? And there's not enough information if we don't do it right. Yeah. I'll have to check. I know that the contemplated <coughs> that long on Batavia Avenue, but I'm not sure that also that stretch on Wilson was contemplated as well. So I'll be sure to include that. And now or, that we know depending the- on how far. I mean, I certainly every as far as we can on Batavia <clears throat> Avenue, and I think parts of yeah. Wilson are important too because I think that frames that other discussion that says, yeah, you really don't need another bridge. Well, and with the fact that we're going to have a traffic light over at Prairie and Wilson, and that's going to change the traffic layout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the stop sign now meters things. The same thing with when we um, looked at the Route 25 jog. By changing the light and the in- intersections there, they actually made that intersection worse if we straightened the jog out. That was, it went from a D to an F intersection. So, I mean, there's things that you don't think about until you see, and, you know, they got computer modeling that can do way more exactly. things now than they did 10, 15 years ago when we first looked at that. So I'm sure that they could be able to extend that out and pick up what that would do to each side. Because I just yeah, look but, at, you know. And that's my hope, is that, yeah, we have computer modeling now that they can just say, okay, what if we did this? And send the cars out and see what happens again. And yep. that's what we haven't had in our last studies that tells us all that. Mm-hmm. So we touched on it briefly last night. We don't need to ask the state anymore. We need to decide if we're bluffing or not. And if we're not bluffing, we need to put the money up yeah. and mm-hmm. do the study. Right. <clears throat> Anybody else? Um, the action item five for all projects in this category, explore grant funding support. <laughs> and Gary has written that a new opportunity for congestion mitigation and air quality, the CMAC funding, is scheduled for 2020. Um, I, we have preliminary engineering already completed on the extending the bike path that's adjacent to the wastewater treatment facility. And so we could apply um, for that project. Now, if in fact we were awarded funding under CMAC, we would still be responsible for our local share, which is likely to be 20%. So I need to identify for city council what that 20%, I think it was a $5 million um, project. So, to move the bike path? Um, yes, because it all has to be cantilevered out because... Oh, we're talking about along the river. Mm-hmm. Along the river okay. next to the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. And I'd like to see those combined with r- riverbank stabilization and not have to cantilever it over but build it on top of the riverbank yeah. sta- stabilization. And I know that that would require our, the Army Corps of Engineers to do that because you would be encroaching into the river to do that. Mm-hmm. So you would change hydraulic, but you'd also be preserving the banks... So I said there's no money. I know. I know there's no money for that. (laughs) But I think you have to you have to look at the big picture of all of it. If there's a way to stabilize the bank and create pad to build the bike path on, maybe we should look at it as combining the two. Yeah, because if we cantilever it, we still have it eroding. We still have an erosion problem right underneath where we build the cantilever part and it falls in. That mean we need to we need to move stabilization up because actually every year that goes by we're making we're falling further and further, and further, and further. right yes. and we so can't, and we can't put it back once it's gone. I'm I'm glad that we we brought up how tied together these these two things might be. Gary definitely needs to be part of that yeah. right. that I conversation that to, to provide be. some expertise in that area. So um, as part of our budget discussions, we'll kind of flesh that out. Um, The next area is downtown development, and action item number one is reviewing our existing plans. Um, You've given us a general direction to uh, that after a new um, economic development staff person is hired, that economic development manager, that um, that's when we should look at those plans. Um, We can wait that long, but you 
may want to start those discussions earlier just because we are seeing a lot of change that's happening in our downtown and merely having the discussion isn't uh, coming to any particular conclusions but maybe you can um, you know have the community discussions and, and get their input and start to kind of coalesce around some ideas as we bring that person on board because they're what they're going to be doing is is uh, they, certainly their input is needed they're going to be executing on the policy decisions that you make yeah and we've been meeting to discuss it um making some updates and trying to identify some some you know the low-hanging fruit that we can maybe work into to future near future plans um and we should probably set a date to be done with that and um present it back to all of you that we have not done and that i will not do right now but we will get that to you <laughs> sounds good what's that's going? a great next step what's what's the hiring process on this person is this going to be an appointment or is it like uh we're not voting on it right? um so you would need to um include it in the 2020 budget and just like any vacancy then we would do our ordinary hiring process for so that individual no yeah um the next action item is um review and revise development incentives and policies. Um, one of the things that has come from that is the development of a new incentive program, which is the Gateway Improvement Plan. And we recently made two awards under that program um, and previously had given an award to Funway. I think was the first re grant recipient, and that was a wonderful project to contribute to um, the incredible six-figure investments that that business owner made to his property. Um, likewise, Michael Marconi and the investment that he has made in his properties over there, being able to offer these additional amounts to see just a little bit more improvement made um, I think is really going to make the difference when people are driving into our downtown area to give them the uh, sense that this is a place that is really taking off in, in prosperity. One of the things that I don't think that we have done is really inventory the incentive programs that exist and determine um, what is the problem that we're trying to solve by having that incentive program in place. This is something that we would want the um, economic development manager to tackle once um, they are brought on, on board in conjunction to the other folks who are working on economic development for the city of Batavia. So I think that this will be a major focus after that person comes on board. <laughs> when you talk about the return on investment of what has been spent for the Gateway program, especially, yeah. the amount that um bob and michael have put in is what are we maybe even five percent of kind of the if total that. i mean if that the of the total budget on those things and talk about just easy win for the community mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. for both of those projects yep have been outstanding for sure so thank you and did you ask uh, michael marconi if he would change the batteries in his clock <laughs> I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but I will. <laughs> it's still right twice per day. <laughs> um, as for the uh, process and service quality improvement, um, the vacancy was filled, and that position has been a tremendous help to the department. In fact, this year, we have seen double the number of building permits, double from the previous year. And I actually do not know how that department would have ever been able to keep up um, as they have been without the addition of that staff. So that has been tremendously helpful. Um, provide customer service training to employees. We did that. And as well, we provided um, a, a communication elements to that training as well. So it was two four-hour programs that we developed, delivered 
not only to the community development department, but to almost every employee in the city had an opportunity to participate. Uh, and then reviewing and revising at least two processes per year. Um, staff is has implemented a revised home permit process. And instead of having to submit multiple permits, um, one permit um, can capture all of the different changes that they're um, going to make. We're still working on our online permitting system. It is almost ready for prime time, but um, we are hoping to complete that by the end of the year so that we can meet our goal of uh, revising at least two processes per year. Uh, page five, uh, review and revise the building code. Did I mention all the building permits that we're reviewing? <laughs> so that has really gotten in the way of us presenting that to you. Uh, apologies, but um, we are hoping that uh, we're going to be able to present that in this fourth quarter of the year. I have all the hail damage. Yeah, that was that was a lot. There were a lot of roofing contractors in with applications. <laughs> Um, the next objective is to increase the availability Laura. of public parking spaces. Laura. Oh, sorry. sorry. Now, before we go to that one. Yes. Um, on the process, <clears throat> excuse me, in service quality improvement. Yes. I remember one of the big talking points we had last year and how we all really got behind um, adding to that department the additional position uh, was because of the wait time for um, permits and or to get not only issued but processed in general right and, and code inspections building inspections to get processed and finalized do we have any sense of what is from the time somebody comes in and requests to the time it's actually completed any sense of an average amount of time going across those to know that we're actually making that substantially better you know it's a great question elliot and it would be to say that a permit was um handed in on a certain date but the building um uh, i'm sorry the permit application issue. was mm -hmm. handed in at one date and the permit was issued on one date doesn't tell the full story agreed there are so many cases where there's a lot of passing it back and forth there are some contractors who will hand in a perfect application and they'll receive their permit in a week and there are others who incomplete information or they're not working on that they're not used to working on that type or that scope of a project and there's a lot of hand holding involved um working on a way to to accurately reflect that the only thing that i have is an anecdotal sense that despite the fact that um we have had double the amount of applications we haven't been able to improve upon the time that it takes, but despite the greater number, it hasn't gotten worse. But that's anecdotal. And that's another reason why um, in the new plan for economic development that we would like to have the establishment of this advisory board, because it offers the opportunity for um, those that we have worked on on development projects to have kind of a third party that they can talk to about it because um, developers, contractors, they're reluctant to give us very honest feedback because they know they're going to be submitting more applications for building permits and they may feel a little reluctant to um, be critical. And so this um, advisory board being a third party group I'm hoping that um, we can receive some real honest feedback about what the process is like in order to improve that for our business and development community. I, I guess I would just say I, I understand that, I respect that, and in, in the same sense, um, it, it, much like in the software development world, there are some things that you know there's just this, you can't frame it in a certain cookie cutter it's always going to go well type of approach. Nonetheless, you still have to figure out what is your performance metric to know that this is operating efficiently or not. And if the time between the steps is efficient 
or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's it's one thing to to execute whatever process um, or step in the process. It's another thing to know that between the two steps, you're waiting five days, right? And so while it may have only taken an hour on step one and an hour on step two, it's actually five days and two hours long for the process to complete. So in some way, shape, or form, we have to be able to frame what is that metric, how we're recording it to know that it's getting better. Sounds like a great object for the next process improvement. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully agree with that because yes. the, all of the business world right now is metrics, 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 metrics. And this is, I think this is the opportunity for where people have always said government should be like a business. Well, no, it's never going to be like that. However, this is one of the areas where government can be business-like mm -hmm. in that we should know what last year's average permitting time. I know that there's always this one needs hand-holding, this one takes a little bit longer, this one takes shorter. But the thing with data is those things always equal out. You're going to have your outliers, but you're going to have your bell curve. And those are the things that we need to know. If last year... Uh, fourth quarter 2017 it took um an average of three weeks to get a building permit processed and you came to us and said i need one more person to take off that load <clears throat> then we look at well, all right well did it did we now take it to 2.7 or 2.5 that we showed yes it is it was justified not anecdotally because Nobody really knows when we're talking about anecdotally, to Elliot's point, are we gaining any efficiency? If we can't actually say without the anecdotes, yes, this person added value because the $70,000 that we added in their salary, we were able to process 40% more, which meant that this year we recouped $20,000 in permit processing fees. Those things tell the story and it makes the public then understand a lot better oh that makes sense so that the next time we gain these efficiencies this year and we had a higher load and that might be off but for the next year we either hire a contract or another person and this is what we're going to be once we start justifying mm -hmm. those um it sells itself and we have all of the 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 data collection um software that's out there right now everybody's everybody's using it but it's making sure that yes. it's used correctly and not just measuring to measure right and and i think that scott buning has um metrics now as part of the presentations that he does in his mid-year and annual reports and i think if you want to see the how the productivity has increased in his department with the addition of staff you're going to see double the number of permits process that right there is an increase in productivity that's been gained due to the addition of that um, individual um, we're just we really need to analyze so that when we say how long did the permit take that we're telling the right story so it really should be not when it was applied and when it was um, issued it's how long did it spend in our hands because there's weeks that it spends in someone else's hands, and that's really not within yeah, the city's yeah. control. How long from right? And, and, and that's exactly what I mean to, by the steps. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's the steps submitted to reviewed, right? And at that mm -hmm. point, it's either complete and from complete to permit issued, right? right. And one of those steps could be third party has to mm -hmm. perform X, Y, and Z, right. and and so it's now really you have party this, A, it goes whatever back it may to be, the, right? Yeah. You have these parts that are outside of our hands yes. of control fine that's a, a still an amount of time but that doesn't necessarily factor in right or needs to be subtracted from the total time what, what but we have to know that time so we can actually figure it out right yeah i mean our ticketing system at work is there's a section waiting on customer mm -hmm. but everything else is internal work mm -hmm. and how long is that taking and mm -hmm. if somebody's sitting on it for a week why are they sitting on it for a week or why does it take a week for that to happen then you analyze that part of so, yeah, we need the metrics, and I know we said that last budget season was we're going to continue to add people. We need to know we're getting a benefit from as right. many of us would have it at our jobs. As I sit here and listen to this, I think of, you know, okay, 
so we got double the permits this year compared to last year but if it's double the roofing permits not double the housing permits it takes a lot less time to do a roof than it does to do a house permit you know and a lot of the yeah. big building that we've had this year we've had to contract out <clears throat> to do some of the inspections and to do that and i think you know i want to look at the numbers and see you know what what are the numbers year to year and that's the only way to do it is to compare those and to see you know did we do 50 percent more housing and 50 percent more roofing or was it five percent more housing and 75 percent more roofing <clears throat> i i also don't want to get i understand where you're going with this and but I, I also know that the department struggles to have enough time just to review the applications and, and keep getting the permits out the door. So I would like to work with our software vendor to determine whether an automated report mm -hmm. might be able to uh, be created. But I know, I know the people in the department will not have three hours per month to dedicate to creating a monthly report. And they shouldn't need to. Okay. If you have the right system, yep, this exactly. is just metadata underneath the hood of the system right. that mm -hmm. somebody even outside the department yes. right. can execute. That'll, that'll be our goal. I understand what you're looking for. I think it's extremely valuable. I'm, I'm hoping that the software vendor can work with us to, to create that automated report. Yeah, and I think this goes to what I said about ViewWorks the other day, was that if we can start comparing ourselves to other municipalities by, oh, somebody reported a pothole, and I know that that just came up, and we had a pretty fast response to that, but you know, now how do we compare to everybody else? Um, and where do we need to make sure that we're targeting our resources across the entire city rather than we're looking at everything department by department as too tactical instead of strategic? Right. Dan? Has anyone in the, uh, in the group done a mortgage refi in the last six months or last year? How long did it take to close from date of application? Roughly. 30 days. How much information did you provide up front? Did, you, did they give you a checklist and say, these are all the things that we need to do yeah, and beforehand? Yeah, and I got 95% of it done on my Excellent. own. It would be very easy. It wouldn't take a tremendous amount of time because one of the first things you said was an application where they provide us with 100% of the information, we can get those done in a week. I'm not interested in those. I'm interested in the ones that take five weeks. We can analyze oh. that file and say, you know what? They didn't give us the information up front. So if every right. permit that comes through gets this opening checklist, that would definitely help. And if there isn't those kinds of checklists there involved. Are. Yeah. That the, uh, the form <laughs> itself that they, they receive yes. has everything that they need to provide. What takes time is when, for instance, um, your architect prepared the drawings against the IBC. Um, they never looked at the local codes to see what we have that's different than the IBC. And then that requires Jeff to identify every single one of the things that are wrong with the drawing that don't conform to our local code and then send it back to everywhere. Okay, that's that's an important <laughs> those are those are the things that take <laughs> that a lot is an important of time. narrative because what you just described there is not Batavia is, is not business friendly. What you described is an incompetent architect that didn't. Turn uh, in but when you're to turn in. when you're the developer, I understand the architect may tell you that they're being difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but see, that, that actually is the point about the whole collecting and measuring of data, mm -hmm. where and I know you had said, well, they don't have time. It's a it, they do, because everybody else in the world is doing it. This, this theory that people doing government work and the tasks that they do are so different than business that it can't be done, that's, that's, that's a, oh, that's and a I false. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't say that. I said I don't, I, I'm hoping that we can work with the software vendor so that if the system is collecting the data, then the system can generate the report. Yes. I just would hate for no. um, someone to create an Excel spreadsheet no. and have to no. sort and um, and that's you know, why all of tables. and that's why all of those days are gone. And that's why the more that the more that government gets used to accepting a lot of the data analytics software that's out there, it will make their jobs 
much, much easier. Yes, but we, so uh, the Llama system, which we use for our project software for developments, I am not sure where that ranks among the most robust and up-to-date systems versus, because it is something that is not a hosted service. It is, you know, something that we bought and installed on our own servers years ago and have been using. So I don't know if it's quite what you're used to using in the private sector. Right. There's probably an aging report in there. There's probably. Yeah. But like I said, I think that's a great next process improvement for us to look at to determine how to identify those metrics. Uh, we were at the availability of public parking spaces downtown. Um, we actually met with Alderman Beck and with Jamie Sam this past week to take a look at a map that had previously been created that was an inventory of all private and public parking that exists in the downtown. We think probably more so than in, uh, that there isn't enough parking spaces that maybe they just aren't in the right places in our downtown. And so we identified um, s some pathways forward for us. One was many towns have created a very uh, visually appealing and simple map that can be provided to people to show them where the available spaces are. Um, the second element that we thought would be good was in our larger public parking areas to actually post a big sign so that if you've driven around this parking lot and it is full, you've got a map that you can consult right there in the parking lot that shows you where other um, available public parking is located. Um, leave anything out? I feel like there's one more thing, but I don't think so. Um, and then the next one is the river. And that is uh, two elements, that creating a master plan for future development of our waterfront and establishing a fund for riverbank um, stabilization. And um, so in our mid-year, we identified that uh, city council said, yeah, please go ahead and contact Geneva and St. Charles and talk about what they're doing in terms of the development of their own riverfronts and see if there is a way that we can collaborate um, with at least those municipalities, if not further north and south, um, to see if we can garner some um, support in the way of grant funding at a state or federal level because we're creating a real economic um, generator in that area when it's not just one community who is improving their riverfront but it's an entire region that's doing it and with regard to the um, riverbank stabilization plan <clears throat> that goes in conjunction with the whole last section of the strategic action plan, which is infrastructure, developing a, a sustainable financial support for our infrastructure into the future. And so I think that needs to be part of our budget discussions as to um, what will we decide to put in that category or, or um, will it be separate funds for separate um, projects that we have? Or as Alderman Ewer suggested, would it be one fund um, that is created that we continuously add to, but that can be used for projects aimed at um, maintaining or improving our infrastructure. It's a big number. <laughs> it's a big number. So we, we kind of already have some of these funds. <clears throat> we have some of these funds. The um, problem is, is that then that we don't have them; that they're underfunded. Right. And so and improvements really have been made over the last several years, and I don't want to minimize that. It's a great start. Um, we just need to talk about uh, moving it ahead. You know, is, is funding our sidewalk program at $100,000 enough if it means that it's going to take 100 years in order to, you know, put in all the sidewalks that we need? 
uh, or um, is do we want to put more toward some of these things? So are we making these decisions before the budget is, is presented to us, or are we making these decisions as the budget is being presented to us? I think making the decision as the, the, the budget is um, presented to you. But wanted to have this discussion so that you're, you're thinking about the prioritization of uh, things. And what you, you know, what we're going to be talking about in the budget is funding not only what you want to see in terms of the projects that are done in 2020, but is there some type of fund that you want to create that is forward looking and saying, instead of saying, we know that something is going to cost $5 million in the future, get to the point where that is now's the time that we want to do that and having to spend the five million dollars all at once or creating a certain portion of our regular budget where a, an amount is being put away every year so that once we get to that point where we're ready to let's say modify the dam and notch it out so that it's navigable by canoes and and kayaks and um and or if there's some type of stabilization that needs to be done for, to keep the, the water in the pond. Is that something we want to start saving for now? Or is that something that we want to wait until we have further clarification of what our actual plans are in that regard? Those, those are the type of decisions that need to be made. So how do, what is the baseline for what the budget is going to show us um, we're treading water on sidewalks or we're on line to have them all replaced within 100 years that's probably a number we need to know walking into that discussion so that's just for new sidewalk that means to put a sidewalk where none exists today um, one hundred thousand dollars would get that done in 100 years that's re the repair uh, and replacement of existing sidewalk is a whole nother fund, which is adequately funded at this point. So then we need to make a policy decision on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Or an addition, an additional with the sidewalk policy is we may it may be insurmountable that we just can't do it. So should we be thinking more strategic and not the entire city is going to take X amount of dollars for all sidewalks everywhere? Do Is the more prudent thing to do identify those areas that are the highest traffic around schools, which I know that we've talked, uh, making sure that we pick the priority areas first, schools, the a linear square around the downtown and start from there and do those things first that those are going to be the ones where people are going to be walking if someone wants to put and we've had this before on some discussions where putting a strip of sidewalk where maybe one person is going to walk on it yeah. in their entire life should sense. not be should be subtracted from the hundred year and all of those calculations because it's never going to be used. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to be strategic in where should the sidewalks actually go, yes. and what is the number for that? Because that number might that. actually be mm -hmm. a lot. We do that. More it's called safe routes to school. school, and so the city meets with the um, school district in planning. Um, what are the next areas that we want to tackle mm -hmm. for safe routes to school? Because we actually do apply for okay. grant funding. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. Um, but that's exactly how we prioritize it, is the safe routes to school. Right. And so we've talked about that with, you know, and that's why I was saying, like, the schools part of it. But where do we go from there? Like, the second priority areas should be some of the major arterial roads where we have you know, on even just taking Batavia Avenue, there's a large strip of that that does not have sidewalks, which leads to the public transportation. And so those ought to be the priority areas are where is the most traffic that's going to get the most use of these, figure out the, the 
total square linear amount that that's needed and start from there as a much more manageable piece to know where we can. And then extra money can go to the second areas, the third areas, and kind of forget maybe some of those areas that in 100 years, nobody's going to walk on. And that's really how it's been done the whole time I've yes. been on the council. Yeah. I mean, that's really what the priority was, was areas that connect to schools that can get people out of cars, onto sidewalks, and in and out of the schools. That, that was priority number one. And then it was anything that tied sections of the city together that were separated, where you had sidewalks <coughs> in the new neighborhood, an old neighborhood in between it, and then a really old neighborhood that had sidewalks built in it to try to get those connected. And that's really what the plan's been all along. So I don't think we're ignoring anything out there or, or trying to change the priorities. I think we're just talking about the whole number in total is a hundred grand a year for a hundred years. But I think what Marty is saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that is that a hundred years to put a sidewalk on both sides of every street in Batavia. Right. Because yes. if that is, I don't think we need a sidewalk on both sides of every street in Batavia. Right. And it would take us less than 100 years. Now, somebody might but argue. But we're with prioritizing it. So the areas that we don't need it will get done in the 99th year. But do they ever need? Do they <laughs> need do they to they get done at all? I mean, that's it's. My guess I, is this I will don't peter out before yeah. the 100th year. Sure, but I don't want to sidewalk. In, I don't want to. <laughs> There'll be other priorities my, that we need to my, address. You might not be here then. <laughs> but, but that's that's no, the. My neighbors and I don't want a sidewalk in front of our house. Mm -hmm. So. That's an area that yes, that gets pushed off, mm -hmm. but maybe never is never needed. But that's what we're doing. That's the first one. We're so doing. I think <laughs> I think that Justin, we're doing exactly what you guys are talking about. Yeah. Right, but I think but it but it goes back to like kind of what Mark is saying though is reframe it so that it, when everybody's eyes glow, glows over is when we're talking a hundred years. It's never going to get done. And when we keep talking about it in those larger pieces, the narrative is that it gets people going, it's never going to get done. And it, it just philosophically doesn't. What we do is bite off exactly what we've been doing, start telling a better narrative, mm -hmm. which is we're doing X amount here for this year and sell that. That's what we did. With well, maybe the, what we can do, because it is simply equation of linear feet of sidewalks. So we can say yep. every year we put $100,000 toward new sidewalk, which equals blank linear feet. And, and where it's going. It sets people's expectations because they probably... Now, one Batavian can probably fathom in their mind all of the places where sidewalk does not exist. Mm -hmm. Same. I it's we're the same. Over, I, I think we're totally overthinking. This. Yeah, I do too. I mean, we could say we're going to spend $100,000 and in 50 years we're going to have half the city done that isn't done now. It's not going to happen. I just think we just keep right. building it. Just keep we going. just keep building it. We, we do what we've always done is start up by the most populated areas that need sidewalks around schools and then constantly think about how we tie that into public transportation and moving people by foot traffic but again it's the narrative so if yep. we say in five years we anticipate that we can have the sidewalks that would get 75 percent of the people to be able to walk to every school would be a much better thing than saying in a hundred years we're going to have sidewalks on both sides of every street right. because that's we're not something doing that people either, can vision. Either of yeah. those is it really necessary to it's, make that commitment? What if that costs three hundred thousand no, dollars? No, but per if year? you d based on linear feet, I'm just throwing out a number. I'm trying to but put it. So it's a better narrative. But the narrative right now is safe routes to school. Yes, yeah. sure. But you and don't. So that is the narrative. So, so when is that going to be done? <laughs> It's not going to be done. <laughs> but we can make it, it done. No, we can't make it done because the, the sidewalks break down. I mean, it's... it's, it's, it's this kids next to you are never going to school, Mark. Right? We're only talking about building new ones. Yes. And I that's understand. why I think I mean, we're well, then, totally overthinking this. Yes, and we're spending way too much time on well, this. Well, then, then your point, how many schools do we have that, that don't have sidewalks? That's, that's what I'm saying. There can't be many. If it's not that many, if it's, I don't know, if it's five miles a side, I don't even know how many miles a side was. Nobody, yeah. what's the figure? We've been working we got on it for longer than 10 years. We've been working on it for at least 10 years, and yep. I know we got a lot left. But my, my point was, I think we got hung up on sidewalks. We didn't even start talking about stormwater, and it's 9 o'clock. So. 
That's, we don't. That's we don't. where the money is. That's the money problem that we have. It's not a hundred thousand dollars on sidewalks. It's the multiple millions of dollars we're not spending on storm sewer. Right, and that's that needs to be with Gary here talking yeah. about yeah. what the hard numbers are. Gary provided that um, three part report mm -hmm. um, a couple of months back, and that will be what we refer to. Okay. Just in a way to frame priorities, and maybe if it's in a pedestrian or cycling plan for next year, um, there's also programs out there, safe routes to transit and safe routes for seniors. And um, there's probably not as much money out there as safe routes to school, but those programs <coughs> do exist, and then we can start identifying projects cool. by that. I think a Fabian Crossing with Homestead being right there, a safe routes for seniors project might mm -hmm. pop up there. So just something mm -hmm. to keep in your notes. Great. So just real quick, to Dan's point about where he was talking about the stormwater, what we're talking about is exactly what we did with not by not doing the uh, stormwater uh, utility. We laid it out and said we are doing X amount of projects and it's going to cost this and that is the tax increase for that year. It is the same thinking. It's not overthinking. It's laying out exact projects that we're going to mm -hmm. do, say this is what we're going to spend on the money, so that when we did the tax increase for specific stormwater uh, utility right. development or uh, projects, there was no blowback from the community about it because they knew exactly what we were doing. They knew why we were doing it. So if we're going into this framework of always saying, we need X amount of money for this project that we're going to do this year, and it needs a slight, uh, there is a deficit in collecting, and this is why we're collecting for this year. Those are going to be the things that on a yearly basis, we. If we raise or lower taxes, it is tied to something that people will see projects that are being done the right. next year. Which I is, understand which what you're saying. Which is wholly different than just yeah. this nebulous, we're collecting because we're going to do stuff to maintain. People want to know but how not. much. We're not. Every year we come out with the exact map. <laughs> Of, and just like we do with crack filling, just like we do with the road resurfacing, just like we do with, um, it's it's the same way with the sidewalk at repair and the um, new sidewalk that goes in. There are maps that are available on the city website that show exactly what the projects are. And the way that it's different from the stormwater is we said, Ward 1 has a flooding issue. Area three, I don't know why it's Ward one and mm -hmm. area, but it goes back to the planning of all of it. Area three has a, the, um, the, the combination sewers, combination sewers, sewers, sewers that need to be separated. It's very finite, you know, in, in these, this area and this area. When it comes to the sidewalk plan, it spans the entire city. But I think that's what but even it then, is, it's still finite. There's a finite number of sidewalks. But we're doing it. So every year we create a plan for which sidewalks that we're going to fix. So I'm not sure, is there a problem when we say the 100000 that you have budgeted for new sidewalk is going to be applied here? Is there a problem with the way that that okay, plan so is presented? Let's say, let's say we need three miles. I'm just making up numbers. Let's say we need three miles of sidewalk, and it costs $100,000 a mile. To three miles of sidewalk would get us within a mile and a half, would cover the rest of a mile and a half within every school that we have. I'm, again, I'm making up numbers here. And we said, oh, that's going to take us $100,000 a mile or whatever it is, and that's going to take us three years. So in three years, we will have sidewalks on every street within a mile and a half of every school. Then that's something that we can broadcast to people. And if people say, wow, can we do that quicker? Because my kids are going to the middle school and I'd like those finished. And we'd say, sure, we can do it quicker. We can raise your taxes so that we can make that happen faster. If we had a definitive thing, because saying it's going to take 100 years to put the sidewalks in, that, again, it's nebulous. And nobody really so, understands what that means. But if you said it would take I, We will never years. refer to the 100 years ever again. <laughs> so I'd be happy. To agree but I'm saying to it, that, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that the engineering department is planning sidewalks in the wrong way. But, the, but the, and, and I'm happy to maybe we can have that as a separate cow discussion to say discussion about how the city prioritizes and plans for new sidewalks. Does anybody? Because I'm not qualified to. But really the, 
really a, say there is, how a city should plan There for is a problem, and the problem goes exactly to what Dan is saying, is we have a gap. The gap exists that we're not saying that we're we have to figure out how to close it by saying that we're doing that comparing it to crack ceiling and all of those things is not equivalent because we're not collecting for crack ceiling every year what we're doing and there's no gap on that we collect taxes for that and we do that the gap we have more money that we need to collect we need to be able to say, because otherwise it should just be rolled into everything every year. And those are the things. But we know that it's not because we have this gap that we're not working to close. What I'm saying... It just it, wasn't funded. That's, I, I guess, I, I'm, not, I'm not really understanding. What is the, what's the problem? <laughs> are we collecting enough money right now? No. To do what? To do the stormwater, to do the sidewalks, to do those things that are not budgeted. It depends what you're trying to accomplish. So okay. we are not stormwater alone to do to build all of the sidewalks to create sidewalks everywhere in the city of Batavia within five years. We are stormwater alone. Are we underfunded? Yes. yes. How are we going to fill we that gap? We actually aren't as underfunded in stormwater as we are in streets. Streets is really the problem, and that was due to the economic incentive program that forced us to yes. um, move all of our projects up because we received that $7 million that needed to be spent within six years. So now we've created the scenario where that is what gets funded every year and we need to make up for that gap so because you did three hundred thousand dollars more one year and three hundred thousand dollars more the following year to fund stormwater stormwater is pretty okay you know what um, let me let me just stop it right there because we are underfunded with stormwater because what we're doing we're not planning for the future with stormwater. We're, we're taking out a three-foot pipe and putting back a three-foot pipe. We're taking out a two-foot pipe and putting in a three-foot pipe. There was a study at Harvard that just happened that said, you know, climate change is upon us. And I know I've been saying that, but the, the study in Harvard said, you know, you really have to plan with bigger pipes, and we're not doing that. And Gary and I have that discussion every time it comes up, and I believe I'm right, I believe he's wrong. Well, Respectfully but, so, but if, if we need to start making our pipes bigger, mm -hmm. because it's not only in the first ward. The first ward got, I believe, got shortchanged because we didn't do it correctly. I hope the rest of the council in their wards, because there's, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a quality of life issue when your home floods and your streets flood. It becomes a quality of life issue when you're bringing your mattresses out to the sidewalk, and we're, we're, that's going to continue to happen if we don't address that underground infrastructure, and we're not going to address it. We're, we're, we're just putting a Band-Aid on it, and, and I feel that strongly about it. Didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think we're terribly underfunded. I think that we are having discussions now that are discussions about what our budget needs to be as opposed to what our items for the strategic action plan, although the infrastructure and making sure that those things are properly funded is part of our strategic action plan. This discussion, robust discussion that we've had shows that um, this is really moving in a positive yes. direction to say Absolutely. we're being we're talking honest about, about the costs yep. that we need to address the problems not only that exist today, but that we anticipate in the future. So I think it's great. And so my direction to staff would be is to give us a budget that um, uh, makes us raise our eyebrows. I'm okay with that um, because if the if we legitimately need to raise taxes to pay for things that have to be done or if we legitimately have to make a case to the public on the things that need to be accomplished, I would rather staff be honest and say um, this is the project that we need to do. If we as a council choose to peel projects off, mm -hmm. then it's at our peril that we are shortchanging. Uh, the citizens. Great. Great. That's well, all. And I think that that's one of the things I sit here and think of that, you know, what are the real problems we're trying to solve? If, you know, we spend $100,000 and it takes 100 years to build out every sidewalk in the entire town, that's the reality of what we can fund and what we can do. 
And if we want to do it sooner or you want to make it a different thing, then we got to raise taxes. We can't, on one hand, say we're not going to raise taxes to do anything and yet complain about the fact that we are 100 years behind finishing sidewalks. That was not so, my point. My point was <laughs> more clearly defining it. I, it's, uh, do we have people coming in and complaining that we're not building sidewalks fast yes, enough? Yes, people that... People that live near schools. You're not. Not no, you're not. Not saying schools. You're people on Republic. <laughs> no. Since I've been on the council, that's all I've fought for that I really adamantly fought for was to get sidewalks built to a school. Right. You did. So. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say, I have, being the old man there in the room, that you go out and tell Batavia you're going to build sidewalks and you're going to get one massive amount of opposition. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, 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 I, I guess it's probably best to stop it's the like discussion because we're totally <laughs> misinterpreted. No, we're being totally misinterpreted. Yeah. Significant. Huge. But then once we're, you get it, we're being totally misinterpreted. <laughs> Because exactly. we're we're not making it clear, and I don't know how to make it any clearer. It's, it's so a we thing. It's a stop. thing. If you if if we all think of the city as, uh, for example, we need shelter, we need to buy a house. It's a three hundred thousand dollar house. In order to get that, it's gonna be fifteen hundred dollars a month. The problem is, is we're not paying the fifteen hundred dollars a month towards that right. conceptual mortgage. We're literally paying one hundred and fifty dollars, and so the gap that we've created, whether it be sidewalks or whatever project it is, we should have staff come back to us and say, hey, that $150 you've been putting up, you need to increase it by about $1,000, and this is the impact on uh, property taxes for that. If you don't want to fund it at the full $1,000, this is what you're doing to your town. Yeah, I, I think how we I frame it, which that. is a, a lot of what I've been hearing is how we frame the discussion, yeah. Yeah. that comes after we decide well, how much money we're going to spend on what project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once we know that, then we can frame mm -hmm. then you know what you're how framing. we present that. Because we know what we're framing and we're presenting. And if I can interject, um, from all of the strategic planning discussions that I've had over the last decade, this is by far the most important document that we've had and the most well, important discussions that we've had regarding some of these this projects. Document. What did you do I before this document? Because I honestly feel like moving forward, I hope I'm not the only one that feels that way. No, absolutely. These are the strongest discussions we have had cool. in years. You're not. When you see the future. That's awesome. You're, you're not the only one that feels that way. And, and mm -hmm. certainly the first year that I was on where we didn't have this, and then the year that we have had this, yeah. it has been night and day. And it's refreshing mm -hmm. to come back to it. Yeah. It's, it's not the thing that we updated or, or created. And then it just kind of right. sat out there. To come back to it regularly, that's the important part. It doesn't matter how good the plan is unless you actually do something with it. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's something that we've been, over the years, have been, we've made lots of plans, but we've only achieved little things. And I think that that's really important that we do think further out into the future and we do think about not just even the time we're going to be on the council, but how does this impact the next 20 or 50 years? And I, I agree with all of that, but I think you're kind of, when you were saying it's about raising or not raising taxes, that is completely kind of erroneous to what we've been doing, at least since my time on council, which has been to raise and fund those things, which the gap that we're talking about realistically happened in the 30, 40 years before oh, all of us anyways. Right. That was the American way of build out and development. Yeah. We will never financially be able to no. get back to that. But, but, what we've been, but what we've been doing is chipping away at it mm -hmm. responsibly by putting those things in place which raise taxes when need to be and we're able to explain, which goes to why the narrative in this day and age is so important for being able to tell people what you're doing with money. It goes to mm -hmm. the core part of what people talk about with the uh, talking point of transparency. Transparency, transparency. What it actually means is we're asking you for X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. This year, we're going to build out A, B, and C. We're going to do Mike's Ward. We're going to do this and that. And we're going, we have a gap in that. And this is what we need to make up that gap. Everybody voted for that because that's what we knew we were doing. That It's not about overthinking it. It's about telling the story that we 
as governments have not been successful in doing for a very long time. We have been very successful in it because that's what we've been doing right the past several years is this is where the problem is. This is our responsibility. We know we can't figure it out. We've not been kicking the can down the road. To the contrary, we've been hitting these things head on. Right. When and we passed the gas tax, we said it was going to be for roads and infrastructure. Well, and constitutionally, we have to. But we've been all of those things, all of those things we have been saying with narratives and people are seeing specific projects tied to them. That's all we're saying is not talk in nebulous terms anymore. Be concrete. Say this year, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it and move on to the next one. Everybody loves that. You know, documents that I don't think a lot of people know exist. They're awesome they're in the back of the budget back of the budget yep yeah. they're the cips yeah, that's like yep. the first thing i read <laughs> they're yeah. awesome exactly. i mean yep. that is a seven year chart yep. of exactly how the money's going to be spent what mm -hmm. we're going to accomplish do we have grant funding that's helping us there's a wonderful narrative everybody should read those mm -hmm. to see those are the do. biggest projects well, we, yes so just to kind of close up my, the comment I was going to make about this document and this process, um, it, standing on top of what I said, it's great to go through this, but now the second part is, is there anything that we're missing that right. ought to be on this? It's not just visiting what is the existing plan, but also does something need to change or get added to this plan? And, and so that's, that's not a, a question, nice I guess, just for segue. you, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. That's a nice segue because I think earlier we had brought up the community survey, right? And that's initially when we said we were going to embark on this process to come up with the strategic plan. That's the first thing we did. We said, hit pause. We need the community input first to determine where does the plan need to go. That was two years ago. And so um, I, back then we suggested, and I'm asking you now if you think it's time. I, I do think that yes, our community yeah, yeah. has really yes. changed. Now, how will we do this? I would like to suggest, because um, we were talking about utilizing metrics, that we take a more scientific approach to this in the future. That's why she didn't put this in the memo. She wanted to surprise this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the National Community Survey. Hundreds of municipalities across the country utilize the exact same survey so that you can then compare yourself to hundreds of other communities, millions of residents across the United States. Um, they will prepare um, the mailing, a five-page survey to 1,700 households or for an additional $2,000, a sam increase the sample size to $3,000, I'm sorry, to 3,000 households, um, which I think would be very much worth it for us. Um, I'm amazed that just sending out a survey on a postcard that was in SurveyMonkey last time that we got over 1,000 results. Um, that was pretty incredible. Um, but to triple that sample size, I think really would be worth it. And in addition to that, they offer for free an online opt-in survey. So we have the ability to perhaps get even more um, participation. For a small uh, additional amount of $910, they do geographic subgroup comparisons so that we could determine on a like by ward basis how our data compares with one another. And so those base services add up to $15,690. On the flip side are optional add-on services. So you could do a custom benchmark comparison if there are just certain types of communities that you wanted to compare yourself to. They will do a customized uh, benchmarking report or and the geographic subgroups or demographic subgroups. Um, those are things that we consider. 
It sounds like we might benefit from adding an open-ended question. <laughs> so that is uh, one thing that is on here as well. And then um, to determine whether we want an in-person presentation of results, I think that's something that we don't need to determine from the beginning of, of the project, but we can decide um, later. Staff feels that an instrument like this repeated on a every other year basis would be very valuable to, for us to say whether we are um, yeah, winning or losing, right? Um, and then how we compare with, with other communities that are out there. The cost of the survey that we did on our own, on my rough numbers, I wanna say that we spent about 7,000 dollars on that survey but wasn't very scientific you know i think that in that case we got a lot of people responding who like to respond to surveys and that mm -hmm. in and of itself um kind of skews the the results so the way that the households are selected and directed to um would give us probably a little bit more reliable results than we had before. Um, we are able because of, um, I, have, I have room in my budget this year based on you know professional services that I ended up not having to expend, that we could actually um, do, we can actually have this under our 2019 um, budget because there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in in preparation for sending the survey out but i i would like us to be ready to send the survey out in um january of next year so if you uh are in favor of doing this it's something that i still have the capacity to do within the administration budget of 2019. Interesting, even 100%. more now that you say that. Because <laughs> yeah, I also look at and think of it, the time that you had involved with it, doing it at seven or eight thousand, whatever the mm -hmm. actual number was, um, and what this would cost, but not having to put nearly the same amount of time into it yeah. because somebody else is doing it. Yeah, I, I would say that, that I spent I about was... eighty hours doing that community survey <laughs> last year. I'd say oh, yeah. go for yeah. it. Yeah. I learned that the Kane County Chronicle is the most read newspaper. In <laughs> <laughs> Mark brings that up a lot. <laughs> the most two-paragraphed, well, unless you subscribe. Right. <laughs> 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 wow. Don't you know if you open yeah. it up in another browser, the most read, read the two paragraphs. <laughs> Everybody complains in the community. They always complain about the amount of studies and that for the price of this, this would influence whether or not we would need to do studies. So mm -hmm. I, this is a no-brainer. Great. For, for the, the actual thing that we're actually studying is people's opinions outside of those right. who only want to be the squeaky wheels, that it takes that equation out of mm -hmm. it and puts it back into what is the entire community feeling. Mm -hmm. and especially when it's somebody from the outside. And questions that we can measure against other communities, other yeah. communities, yep. and year to year. Yeah. How do you select an open-ended question? <laughs> Would we do an open-ended question? Is that even a big deal? First, we get a subcommittee together, and then we think about it, and then we come back and, and vote about it. Of the a la carte, the only thing I would truly be adamant about would be the Spanish translation option because we're reaching an entire population mm -hmm. that can't even read the thing if we mail it to them. Right. Good point. Okay. Thank you very much. That is all that I have. Okay. Good. On to project status. You just heard about them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all of them? Really? All of them? And last night, you know. Okay. Nothing um, new since last night. And then, does anybody have any others tonight? Okay. So we go to executive I would session. Ask for a motion to enter executive so session moved. for real estate. And no decisions will come after the executive session. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do one roll call tonight, just for fun. Thanks for coming in, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, you could have just watched it. <laughs> We're like, this meeting's not ending until Mark gets here. <laughs> yeah. We should really, really string it out. Oh, yeah. Just what? We should do what I meant when I said there, Mark. No. Yes. That's what I thought you said. Okay. Miller? Here. This is a roll call for executive session. Oh. So we should right. do. Wait, wait. This is in favor of going. No, this, this is a vote on whether we're going to executive session. Yes. 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 Doing a roll call. He wants to do roll call. <laughs> I just. You said do something. Said roll call. I'm here. No. <laughs> Presence. Miller. I. <laughs> there you go. I what? Yes. Rosado. Beck. Aye. I. I. Nap. Chancet. I. Salvati. Wolf. No. <laughs> O'Brien. I. Callahan, Aye. Meitzler, Aye. Malay, Aye. Ewer, Aye. Cerrone, and McFadden. Aye. All right, that passes. <laughs> I'm going to use it to one. Can we get it recorded?